Okay, so let me start then. Uh, welcome you all to this. I think it's the sixth lecture in the series. Uh, if I'm not counting wrong, uh, that should be the halfway point. Now, uh, we've done a lot of formalism. So let me put down today's date, 7th. We've done a lot of formalism to understand causality in space-time. And then we also spent the last lecture talking about geodesics, both in space and in space-time, and about how focusing um, changes uh, things about whether the distance uh, beyond a focal point is uh, minimized for ordinary space or maximized in the case of space-time. And um, <clears throat> uh, so these things we've already, uh, we've, we've gone into detail. And now it's time to bring some physics into it and ask uh, some questions which actually have to do with general relativity. So space-time is only the setting for general relativity. So Sanket has asked a good question. By the way, the questions on the blog page have also dropped off. I would really request people to post questions there because it keeps me a little bit um, active and able to understand how people are, uh, you know, how well you're following or what are your questions. It, it, it's very useful for me, hopefully for others. So Sanket's question, why do we consider space-time as Hausdorff? So Hausdorff is a separability axiom. So let's just write it. It basically, uh, for an ordinary manifold, says that if I have two points like this, P and Q, then I can enclose P in an open set O. Let's call this point P prime. And P prime in another open set O prime, such that O in and O prime don't intersect. Okay, now you would say that's pretty common sense. <clears throat> it's almost a definition of being able to separate two points. The problem is that this de uh, depends, uh, this property depends very much on the type of topology you have because you're only allowed to enclose in open sets, and the open sets you have to take from that topology defined on the space. And there are topologies which are sufficiently weird that this property doesn't hold. So you can just Google or look up my um, textbook or you can look up where look up world. Uh, there are weird spaces which are not Hausdorff where you can't do this. And um, well, <clears throat> there's a lot of discussion on whether this is uh, required, whether we can relax it and so on. But for me, the intuition is that in that topology, P and P prime should be considered well separated if they are distinct points. Now, well separated is not a statement about distance. This whole thing that I've written here doesn't depend on a metric in principle. It depends only on the structure of open sets. Hmm? But it's a separability axiom, and there are weaker separability axioms that you can look up. But this is the one that people feel is most... Uh, appropriate. One has to define something, one has to agree to work on some kind class of space times. Now, we are working on global, globally hyperbolic um, space times, which um, now I don't remember anymore. Yeah, Arpit, uh, unique limit of sequences in topological spaces. Okay, that's a good point. I had forgotten about that. Uh, okay. And of course, a lot of things we've discussed about compact, closed and compact and so on involve taking limits of sequences. Um, okay, listen, listen, that's that's enough, I think, about this. And, uh, you know, all, all the assumptions we make can be questioned. And it's important to still make assumptions, keep the question aside deduce the consequences of the assumption and revisit the assumption. We'll be doing that today also. We'll make some assumptions which actually aren't even true. And then we'll deduce some consequences and then we'll worry about what to do because those assumptions were not true. That's often how theory progresses. Hmm? Okay, so what are we going to discuss today? Well, surprise, surprise, we're going to discuss the Rai-Chaudhary equation which is the sort of 
motivation of this course of lectures. And for that, I'll use a lot of, uh, uh, well, I'll use some of the things I've developed and I won't use a lot of the things I've developed. So first of all, Rai Chaudhary equation is from 1953. Uh, it's a three and a half page paper with the, uh, let me in fact open it so that I can tell you something about it. Um, give me a second. Um, <clears throat> Now, suddenly, of all things, I cannot find it anymore in my... Ah, here it is. It's called Relativistic Cosmology 1, published in Physical Review on May 15th, 1955. And, but submitted in December 1953. So, I guess it took a year and a half to get published. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so his considerations are about relativistic cosmology. And let me try to paraphrase a little bit the motivation. So motivation of this paper. Uh, now I'm going to write AKR for AK Rai Chaudhary. Uh, motivation was to understand time evolution of a gravitating system. These are more or less his words. From the point of view of an observer in its neighborhood. Which of course, is what we are doing when we observe uh, cosmology, when we discuss cosmology, because we are in the neighborhood of an evolving system. But if we want to know what it did in the past, then we need to go back into the past and study what how its uh, time evolution worked in the past. Now, he, AKR was not the first person to study this question. Okay, there was quite a stellar cast of people studying this question, starting probably with Eddington, Tolman, Bondi. There was also Chandrasekhar, although he is not explicitly referenced in AKR's paper, I believe. Gödel is referenced. Um, that there are very few references, as was the case in those days, and very so Gödel. <clears throat> had uh, looked at these problems, but the key difference or the key um, new um, new um, approach was that uh, these previous authors made use of very symmetric situations. Now, I can't tell you in detail what situations they assumed, but for example, you could assume that there's some point or some axis around which your system is symmetric, and then you can ask about time evolution or cosmology in such a, in such a system. But uh, Rai Chaudhary didn't want to do that. So AKR's uh, approach was to not assume any symmetry. And this was really, uh, as far as I understand, the new feature. Now, why did we assume symmetry? Well, we all know, having studied anything at all about GR, uh, if you want to find a black hole solution, the first one you are taught is Schwarzschild, and for that you assume spherical symmetry, and that enormously simplifies the equations you have to solve. Here, we don't assume any symmetry, but we do choose a good coordinate system, which helps us. We choose a good coordinate system, and we choose associated to it a physical object, which is a geodesic, or actually a family of geodesics. And we try to understand time evolution in very general terms, 
using this family of geodesics. And this, I think, was uh, use geodesic congruence, as it's called. I'll define it below. And one thing that Raichaudhary doesn't really emphasize, but uh, and nor does Wald, I think, but Witten does, is that basically it's a way to define a coordinate system. And it can be thought of, and I've tried to emphasize in my notes, which I'll post after the lecture, that it's a way to define and think about a coordinate system, though in principle, you could do everything, including get those equations without ever talking about the geodesics in too much detail. In fact, maybe without talking about using the word geodesic at all. Okay. So let's, uh, so we'll focus on choosing a coordinate system. Okay. Um, now in GR, we can always choose a coordinate system because we are allowed X goes to X mu prime of X. And in uh, D dimensions, so mu goes from zero, one up to D minus one. I'll keep D in the formulae. Uh, Witten also does that. The point is there's almost no work, extra work involved in that, so might as well. So now um, in D dimensions, there are D such functions. The coordinate transformations and we are free to choose them. And we can choose them to um, simplify the metric. And let's first uh, pick a goal. Uh, what sort of metric would we like to have? So simplify the form of the metric. Notice this is completely different from choosing, from assuming spherical symmetry and then saying, well, the metric is restricted to a certain form. There also you have to choose coordinates, but here we are um, choosing coordinates without assuming any symmetry. And first let's write what metric we want. And then by explicit construction, we'll show how to attain this metric. And then we'll also examine the um, um, possibility that this coordinate system might break down as time evolves. So these are the three steps. I put in some dependencies that people often leave out because it's very tricky when you break things into space and time to, um, uh, to, to remember what things depend on. Okay, so this is the coordinate system we are going to use. And what does it correspond to? So this will arise, this corresponds to G00 equals minus one. Okay, everywhere in space and time and G0i equals zero. And this is D conditions. Because G0i is zero, there are no cross terms dt dxi. Uh, G00 is minus one, therefore the first term is minus dt squared and rest of gij we say nothing about it. So it's anything uh, which is a function of uh, x and t. We haven't fixed it at all, okay? So this is what we want. And because choosing a coordinate system involves integrating something, so for example, uh, we, uh, we have some equation for how the metric transforms under x going to x prime under this. Uh, so we can solve that equation and determine x prime such that these things are true. Now, from now on, I'll assume that I'm already in that new system. Okay, so I'm not going to put primes on everything. The point is, usually you can do this uh, in a small neighborhood, because if, uh, if, for example, I choose coordinates where these uh, equations that I've written here are true at one point in the entire space time, that I can always do, uh, then I can uh, integrate those coordinate change equations and make it true in a very small neighborhood around that. What becomes difficult is to go beyond a small neighborhood because then depending on topology, your uh, construction may run into trouble. 
so we are going to go through that systematically but the the uh, inspiration here or the the the, the insight uh, which i think was the insight of akr use geodesics to describe and study this coordinate system okay so that's what we are going to do now so first let's uh, start with a definition so given m space time and an an open set right now this open set uh, o will not be um any particular space like or a coronal or anything later it will be but given this a congruence is a family of curves uh such that every point p inside this open set lies on exactly one curve which is another way of saying well on the one hand it means um that the curves are non intersecting on the other hand it also means that they are densely packed in in a way that no point p gets left out from them that is there's always one curve exactly one curve that passes through p so another way of saying it conversely would be that um there's every, uh, there's for every point p there is a curve a unique curve that passes through it then it's a congruence if the congruence is made up of geodesics if the curves in this congruence sorry are geodesics then it's called a geodesic congruence then we have a geodesic congruence okay good let's draw it so here is our m the whole space time here is an open set o here is my family of curves and if there's a point p then one curve exactly passes through it none of the other curves however close uh, to p passes through it so it's quite simple um in in some way it gives you an intuition of curves being parallel but remember they can they have the freedom to bend there's a certain you know curves are the points are dense because these are uh, points of topologically of euclidean space so there's quite a lot of choices you can have for the curves with this condition these are also sometimes called integral curves uh, of a vector field so that's another way to say it okay now we are going to do something uh, different we are going to start with a cauchy surface sigma so we are going to now assume m is globally hyperbolic now these words definitely did not appear in akr's paper and i'm not even sure they were i think the earliest reference i know on this term is lire is by the french mathematician lire and he had some notes from 1952 uh, it's actually quite unlikely that akr had access to see those notes and uh, we discussed lire's uh, definition of globally hyperbolic earlier it was compactness of space of curves cpq but okay now in you know in a modern context in a modern treatment we're going to assume m is globally hyperbolic and therefore it has a cauchy surface uh, akr used uh, let's see if exactly what he said um yeah
Yeah. So he certainly doesn't again use the terms like Cauchy surface or anything, but there is implicitly in his descri description an uh, initial value surface. And uh, that's basically our Cauchy surface. So this is uh, Cauchy surface sigma. Okay. And now we are going to construct all time-like geodesics passing through sigma. And in fact, we'll do more. Construct all time-like geodesics passing orthogonally through sigma. Okay, so like this. And this is going to be our congruence. And these are the points where our geodesics pass through sigma and they're going to make an angle of 90 degrees with the tangent vectors to sigma. Okay. Now we want to choose a coordinate system as follows. First, there are two steps, or two steps basically. First, pick a spatial coordinate system only on sigma. Sigma is achronal, remember, and space-like. Uh, uh, and so we can always, so it's just an ordinary, in our case, three manifold. And on a three manifold, by definition of a Riemannian manifold with metric, you can pick a coordinate system and then you can write your metric in that coordinate system. So we assume that we have coordinates X on given on sigma. Now, supposing I want to find the coordinate of an arbitrary point here, P. Then pictorially, it's very easy to tell you how it's done. I simply take this point, find out what geodesic it lies on, because it lies on a unique one in my congruence, and follow that geodesic from P until it hits sigma. And then I give the P, the uh, sorry, I give P the coordinate spatial coordinate x. In other words, if when I follow it back to sigma, it hits sigma at this point, and this point has the coordinate x, coordinate value x, then any point p on the geodesic will also have the spatial coordinate x. Okay, So the spatial coordinate is defined to be the point where the geodesic passing through p goes back and hits sigma. What about the time coordinate? For that, it's very easy also. We simply measure the proper time tau between here and here along the geodesic. Okay, So we calculate the proper time from uh, P back till or from the Cauchy surface to P and we call that T. So T is equal to tau, tau along that geodesic. Okay, And this specifies a coordinate system because now, uh, by definition of the congruence, wherever I might be in my space-time, uh, I'm, now I'm going to assume this congruence is in the whole of space-time, okay? not in some open subset. And wherever I am, I pick my point, I follow it to sigma. The time, proper time that elapses in reaching sigma, that's the time of that point P and the spatial location where it hits sigma, that's defined to be the space coordinate uh, of that point P. Okay, so this, this is the definition uh, of a coordinate system. And now in a moment, I'll show you that this coordinate system exactly has this look. There are three steps in proving that, and we'll go through them. First, are there any questions about this construction? People are quite silent today. Come on, some question. Okay, then I'll assume it's clear. Okay, so now let's move on and show that uh, 
Okay, one uh, small point, of course, I've been discussing it as though I'm only describing points in the future over here, but I can do the same thing in the past. I'll simply give uh, negative values of time in the past, which are minus of the magnitude of the proper time between that point in the past and sigma. Okay, as far as x, the spatial coordinate, it stays the same along the entire geodesic. So every geodesic is at a fixed point in x, but it's not that we choose the geodesic after choosing x, it's the other way around. Whatever geodesic congruence we chose, uh, we'll associate x with uh, a different value of x with every geodesic. Okay. So, so this coordinate system works very close to sigma. Yes, yes, and... yes, absolutely. Very close to sigma. Uh, so far, good. Thank you. And exactly our uh, purpose uh, is that we are not going to go far from sigma. First, we are going to establish all these uh, properties. And then we are going to ask what happens if we try to go further from sigma. Okay. And that's exactly. Yeah. At sigma, time is zero. Exactly. So every point on sigma has t equals zero. That's exactly right. So the Cauchy surface has become the time equals zero surface. Good. Uh, is there a specific reason you're choosing time like and other? Yeah. So the the only two kinds I could choose are time like and null. Not interested in space like uh, for physics reasons, and uh, they require separate treatments. And I think both Ward and Witten do that. They first describe time-like and then they describe null in a separate section. So we'll come to null uh, another time. Today we are just doing time-like. <clears throat> and uh, sort of if you want the physical reason, cosmology uh, has to do with time-like evolution. Uh, while in black holes, because the horizon tilts and the, the horizon is null, a null surface and the light cones tilt, then null geodesics become very important in black holes. So the context of black holes requires us to understand null geodesics, while the context of cosmology requires us to only understand time-like geodesics. And in fact, uh, as Witten uh, points out, and I'll be following him in this, uh, it's a bit of inversion of history because it was first Penrose with null geodesics who studied black hole formation and then Hawking with time-like geodesics who studied the cosmological singularity. But it makes sense to invert the order of presentation because actually now from today's perspective, the time-like case is simpler. So that's the reason. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> recall that d tau squared, the proper time, was defined as minus of g0, 0, 0 dt squared uh, plus g0 i twice dt dx dx i plus g i j dx i dx j. Okay. Now, <clears throat> along a geodesic, the xi is zero because uh, the xi value of every point on a given geodesic is the same. And also d tau is equal to dt. That is exactly our choice. And from these two things, you see that g0, 0 is minus 1. And this is for all space and time everywhere. Of course, within the region where we are uh, defining this, so still close to sigma, but everywhere in the sense, not just on sigma, but even off sigma, g0, 0 is minus 1. Okay, so that's one. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that was the construction. Yeah, now uh, let's say A is this. So we've got one aspect of the metric that we are trying to derive for this geodesic based coordinate system, namely this part, we've got this term, g0, 0 is minus one. What else do we need to have this is g0, i equals zero. So this is done, we need g0, i equals zero. Okay, that's done in two steps. So step B, uh, since geodesics intersect were chosen, to intersect sigma 
orthogonally G0i at x and 0 is 0. Okay. We can only say this is true at t equals 0 because that's the point of intersection. Okay. If G0i at that point of intersection were non-zero, there would be a dt dx uh, term and that would change the angle uh, from being orthogonal. Okay. But we haven't proved that G0i is uh, of x and t is 0 everywhere, only so far on the Cauchy surface. Now for C, proving the last point that G0i of x and t is 0, we invoke the geodesic equation which we've written before. And we now evaluate it using tau equals t. So this dot is supposed to be a derivative in tau, where tau is the proper time. But we've actually, uh, and in fact, the geodesic equation in this form without a right-hand side, and I always forget to write this, uh, This in this form, this geodesic equation holds only when tau is the proper time or for some linear transformations of that. So it's an affine parameter. But in particular, tau is the proper time, and we are calling it t now, and t is x0. Yes, choice of metric is indeed independent of what type of manifold we have, though uh, Sanket, g i j of x depends on what type of uh, spatial manifold we have hmm? that is not uh, um, that is not something we are trying to determine either we have just left g i j of x and t to be arbitrary hmm? and it will be determined by einstein's equations okay back to this so let's evaluate this equation using t equals tau so that means that uh, I basically get uh, when mu is zero, I get, uh, well, actually I can do it at once for all values of mu. So mu is uh, zero, one dot, dot, dot up to D. And you can immediately see that this gives me gamma mu zero, zero equals zero. Okay, how did this happen? Because, <clears throat> In the second term, so first term, if t is tau, x double dot is always zero. If mu was zero, then x double dot is zero. And if mu was not zero, then also it's zero. So first term goes away. And the second term gives me one uh, over here and here only when mu and lambda are equal to zero. And that gives me this. So gamma mu zero, zero is zero. But now if you evaluate gamma mu zero, zero, uh, explicitly in terms of the metric, you'll see that this sets g0 i comma 0 equals 0. That means the time derivative of g0 i vanishes. Okay, Same is true of g0 0, but we don't care because g0 0 is already fixed to minus 1 everywhere. So its time derivative anyway had to be 0. But now we get that g0 i comma 0 is 0. And Therefore, if G0 I was set to zero at the Cauchy surface, it will remain zero any, uh, at any small distance to the future and past. So now we've established that G0 I of X and T is zero, and that implies our coordinate system. So we've shown that geodesic congruence way of defining it and just choosing the coordinate system to look like that are the same thing. Now, this is somewhat obscured in the history. And I must say that for me, at least, Witten made this very nicely clear uh, because uh, for Raichaudhuri as well as for Wald, it's all about the intrinsic geometry of tangent vectors and geodesics. And so Wald actually does the entire definition using tangent vectors and geodesics. And obviously he uh, knows that this is the coordinate system, but I'm not even sure he says so explicitly. Where did my coordinate system go? This one. Okay. But Witten uh, nicely points out that it's basically either we say we want to do this, or we say we want to define a geodesic congruence and from it a coordinate system. And these two are the same thing. The advantage of the geodesic way of thinking about it is that uh, it, we get some physical or geometrical intuition uh, about what's going on, and that's going to help us. So that's the purpose.
Okay. And now that we've established this, we can talk about breakdown. Okay. So, can this coordinate system break down? Well, one way that it could break down, uh, now this again is not something that Rai Chaudhary explicitly asks. Uh, he is actually trying to ask, uh, he does talk about singularities, but the manifold M is okay. And two, something is wrong with M. Possibly a singularity. And to determine which of these two options is the case uh, needs extra work. We can't just, if we find the coordinate system breaking down, we can't just say that, well, uh, something is wrong with the manifold. Uh, we also can't say nothing is wrong with the manifold. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen some um, um, aspects of black hole, uh, say short seal black holes. And you know that the coordinate system breaks down at the horizon, but actually nothing is wrong with the manifold, though it's doing something very interesting. It's changing its causal behavior there, or its light cones are tipping over, as they say. But the, it's only the coordinate system. But then at the core of the black hole at the origin, really, the coordinate system again breaks down. And this time, the manifold also develops a singularity. So the black hole realizes both of these options. Yeah, there's a question. What do I infer from G0 i xt equals zero? Uh, nothing. I just infer that I'm working in this coordinate system because if G0 i xt was not zero, then this wouldn't be my coordinate system. And what I'm going to use this coordinate system for that you'll see in a minute. But basically, this is the only thing left, right? So the only information left to study is Gij. So we've got rid of something which was would have otherwise been annoying and we would have had to keep making formulae for it. Oh, one more comment. Uh, let me make one comment here before I proceed. Thank you for asking this comment. AKR and also Wald do not assume G zero I equals zero. And the point is that uh, they get some, as a result, they get some extra terms, extra term called the twist in the right of the equations. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just telling you this. Hmm? So it's not necessary to assume, but it's convenient to assume that. Witten assumes this and shows that this is actually, in a sense, all of them realize later that, well, this is true. If I choose my geodesics, not just randomly passing through sigma, but to intersect it orthogonally. Yes, Sahil, of course, uh, G0i is the dot product of x vector and time vector. I thought that was clear. Um, the dot product of two vectors v mu and w nu is v dot w equals g mu nu v mu w nu. So this is equal to v uh, g0 0, 0 v0 0, w0 0 plus g0 i v0 w i plus g i j v i w j. This term therefore uh, multiplies the time component of the first vector with the space component of the other vector. Okay. We are just trying to show that the tangent vector of the geodesic is orthogonal. No, we are not trying to show it. We chose the geodesics with that property. And because of that, it follows that G0i is zero on the Cauchy surface. Then we use the geodesic equation to show that G0i continues to be zero off the Cauchy surface. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, now, 
good so what is the criterion for breakdown and when i say breakdown i always mean a uh, breakdown of the coordinate system and from the discussion last time uh, you can guess that it is basically focal the existence of a focal point of the geodesics of the congruence okay why is that a criterion for breakdown well let's look at the situation here are my First of all, of course, uh, once there's a focal point, uh, it's not a congruence anymore, right? So in the same breath, bre uh, focal point and failure of the geodesics to may form a congruence, uh, it's the same thing. Okay, Because once they meet, then it's no longer true that one point lies on one and only one geodesic. And let's see what problems this creates. So here are two geodesics that meet. And here's my point that lies on both of them. Now I'm supposed to ask what is the x coordinate x and t value of p. But the problem is that I can follow p back here and read off its x coordinate to be the x coordinate of this point. Or I can follow p back along this and read off its x coordinate to be the x coordinate of this point. And so there's no well defined x coordinate for p. So whenever geodesics intersect, then I can't define the x-coordinate anymore uh, for the point of intersection. And therefore, uh, focal point uh, causes the coordinate system to break down. Now, in terms of the metric, when will this happen? Well, notice that as long as we are going up along the geodesics in our nice coordinate system, um, uh, what did I want to as, as we go up along the geodesics, two different geodesics are simply separated. Okay. What makes them meet will be if uh, the metric Gij develops a zero eigenvalue. And why is that? Well, imagine that, so just as an example, imagine G33 goes to zero, okay? Now, if I have a two geodesics, which are at the same start on sigma at the same point in X and Y, but separated only along Z, let's draw that. So this is the Z axis and let's say these are the x and y axis all inside sigma then i have two geodesics here and here and they take off like that and the separation here is governed by g33 okay because this uh, arrow i've drawn here is a coordinate separation and g33 times that dx squared actually tells me the um the separation, the physical separation in the points. And this is G33, remember, not the one that was down on the Cauchy surface, but of X and T. And we got to this value by evolving from the Cauchy surface using some equations, which will be Einstein equations, which we'll bring in in a few seconds. Okay, so if G33 goes to zero, that's when then these two will sort of bend over and meet. Okay, so the distance between them will shrink as G33 shrinks and will go to zero. But of, of course, this 3, 3 is just a choice of our coordinate axis. More generally, uh, it's just Gij developing a zero eigenvalue. And if Gij develops a zero eigenvalue, an equivalent condition is that debt G is zero. And I'm going to write it explicitly, uh, debt of Gij. Okay. Now there's one weird way you could get around this, which is that supposing G33 goes to zero, but G22 goes to infinity at the same uh, time, then uh, the product of those could remain finite. And Witten discusses that uh, possibility and argues that it doesn't happen. 
So I'll I'll refer you to Witten's notes for that. So we are going to use this, and this is also the criterion that Wright Chaudhary used. Okay. So in fact, he examined that. So AKR examined time evolution. of a quantity which he called capital G and it was a bit puzzling when I first read it but now I think I understand it which is debt to the one-sixth power of G i j uh, Wald and Witten and basically all modern treatments uh, define instead something called V which is debt to the one by two of G i j it really doesn't matter which power of debt of G i j vanishes uh, so we can as well look at, and root dead G is a nice thing. It appears in Einstein's action and so on. So we we'll look at V. However, Rai Chaudhary was being pretty smart when he chose G because certain equations simplify uh, for his choice. And let me explain here this number one sixth, which may be puzzling you. It's dead to the one over two D minus one of G. D minus one, remember, is the dimension of the matrix G I J. And for him, D was D is always four, so he gets one by six. But in general, if we want to use his variable G, I'll assume that in general dimensions is defined by that. While Wald, Witten, probably Hawking, Ellis, everybody who discusses this subject uses V. It really doesn't matter, as I said, which one we want to use. Okay. Now we what we do want, however, is to find the time evolution of this quantity using Einstein's equations. And so today, halfway through a course on supposedly on GR, I finally write Einstein's equations. I think that's quite an irony that we spend so much time uh, building up to it, making so many, uh, doing so much topology and differential geometry of space time. But that's really what I had in mind in the first place. So I'm not sorry I did it. Let's write Einstein equations in the following form. R mu nu is equal to 8 pi g t hat of mu nu, where t hat is obtained as the stress tensor t mu nu minus 1 over d minus 2 g mu nu t alpha alpha plus 1 over 4 pi g d minus 2 g mu nu lambda. So uh, the first part should be easy. It's a small exercise if you've never seen it before. Einstein equation originally has r mu nu minus half g mu nu times r. But if we only want to solve for r mu nu, then we trace the equation and we find the relation between the Ricci scalar r and the trace of t, which is this quantity, t alpha alpha. We use that to eliminate r from the equation, basically take it to the other side, and then we get this form. Finally, this, if I put it in here, just gives me the standard definition um, of cosmological constant now i'm a little yeah so this is one uh, this gives me precisely um, um, g mu nu lambda in four dimensions and i think this is right but i'm, I'm actually not completely sure but uh, anyway let's see i'll check it later Okay, but uh, what we've done here is to incorporate the cosmological constant into the definition of the stress tensor, just for convenience. Uh, it has different physics, as you know, from the stress tensor of ordinary matter. Uh, again, now, if you want to compare with works of other authors, then uh, Rai Chaudhary keeps it explicit, uh, and Wald also. Lambda term separate. There's no difference. It's just that they've written it explicitly and they talk of stress energy and lambda contribution separately. Uh, Witten doesn't mention it in the beginning, which made me quite confused until at some point he says, well, the contribution of the stress, uh, of the cosmological constant to the stress tensor is 
um, can be of the wrong sign depending on sign of lambda so as above so although you won't find the formula explicitly but Witten's formula for t hat is basically in basically means this okay good won't work for d equals two yeah a lot of things don't work for d equals two indeed uh yeah how do they decide what value of d no uh, we are not trying to decide what value of d should be chosen we are trying to basically do two things one we are trying to make some theory applicable to our world where d is four so d is just a proxy for the number four which we can put at any time but since there are theories which apply in other dimensions than four uh, and which might be interesting which are speculative uh, it doesn't hurt to keep d arbitrary and you can always put it to four at any stage that you like so it doesn't really change much of the discussion just to keep d just a parameter that's floating around mm -hmm. and uh, for practice as i said right Chaudhary certainly didn't even entertain the possibility that d could be different from four but uh, this is slightly more general okay good why have we chosen a coordinate system in which time is taken to be the proper time? Because it gave us G00 equals minus one. And so that the metric could be as simple as we wanted this one. It's only because we chose the coordinate time to be the proper time that this term is minus dt squared. Otherwise, it would be minus G00 dt. Or it would be G00 dt squared and G00 would be non-trivial. So that's the reason. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now a little bit of calculation. So it's very simple, and uh, I've uh, written it out in my notes very uh, in in great detail and very carefully. So I don't think you'll have any problem. But anyway, uh, I've written all my notations and conventions in the appendix to the notes, and so we have. Uh, this formula for R00, which is what we are going to consider. Sorry for my handwriting as always. Uh, these indices, repeated indices are always summed over. I think uh, that you know, particularly important in relativity. And Okay, now we already showed uh, that uh, because of this choice of geodesic coordinates, gamma upper alpha lower zero zero vanishes. So this term is gone, this term is gone, and only the remaining two terms survive. Next, we evaluate. So to evaluate both of those terms, we only need the quantity gamma alpha zero beta. And out of these, uh, we have the following results. Gamma 0, 0, beta is 0. And gamma alpha 0, 0 is also 0. There's an overlap between these two equations because when alpha and beta are both 0, it's the same equation. But otherwise, it's different. And all of these follow from, it's very simple, from G0 i comma 0 equals 0. So see the brilliance of these geodesic based coordinates and choosing the orthogonally intersecting ones. Uh, that and G0 0 equals minus 1. So again, I emphasize no symmetry assumption, no assumption literally, except that there is a coordinate system within at least some dis that the coordinate system we are working with makes sense for some distance uh, beyond uh, the Cauchy hypersurface. And we are going to even find out how much uh, distance that is. OK, so setting all these components of gamma to 0, we are only left with components of the form i0j, where i and j are space indices. And this one is g i k g dot j k. So these Latin indices K are summed over the D minus one values. Hmm? Okay. And that's all we needed. And from here, we can, uh, so this is going by a bit fast, but I can tell you that it will really help you if you uh, work this out yourself. So we revisit this, this term and this term. And using these conditions, we get 
the simple result that R0 is minus a half del 0 G I K G J K dot minus one fourth G I K G oops I think the first term was G yeah sorry first term was G I K dot G I K everything is contracted in the second term it's G I K G dot J K G J L G dot I L. Okay. So R zero zero is convenient because in this formula, as it came out from this analysis, uh, you see that because this term dropped out, it means the space derivative term dropped out. So there are only time derivatives left, and even within uh, the gamma that is surviving, there's only a time derivative. So that's really convenient. So everything is only in terms of time derivatives. Okay. So now uh, we need to, how do we proceed further with this? And this is where we realize the quantity of interest to us and whose time evolution we want to know is V is V defined as, uh, I already wrote it, V equals Z to the half Gij. You can uh, start right here by defining instead G, which is debt to the one over twice D minus one of G I J. And you can proceed with that and you'll get some equations, which are basically the same, but I'm doing this. Uh, in fact, I like those, but I'm doing this because somehow this is uh, now in the literature, very standard. And also probably because root debt G is a nice standard quantity. Okay. So this is one quantity, and there are two more quantities which, have, which are defined in terms of V and in terms of Gij, and they are quite useful. And let me first write their names. They're called the expansion, and the other one is called the shear. And they have nice physical meanings, almost the obvious ones. So the expansion is called theta, and it's nothing but so you can define it two ways. You can either say it's half G I K G dot I K. That's note that that's this term in the in R zero zero in the Einstein equation. So it's just that term with the half. Okay, but this also can be written in another way as uh, V dot upon V, where V is defined above. Why is half G I K G dot I K equal to V dot upon V? It's a standard identity relating uh, and, and it's given in the appendix of my notes. So this equality is an uh, equality which basically says M inverse trace M inverse M dot equals debt M inverse debt M dot. This is true for any matrix that depends on time, or actually you can just take any infinitesimal variation of a matrix and you get this formula. And uh, the reason why the half disappeared in our uh, relation is because V is defined not as dead G, but as dead to the half of G. So if you put that in this relation, then you get, uh, you get this equivalent. So theta is V dot upon V. Okay, what is it physically? It's the d by dt of log debt to the half of the of g. Okay, so it tells me the time variation of the log of the determinant of the metric, and that's the quantity that I'm worried about because if that determinant uh, goes to zero, log will diverge, and that's where my coordinate system is going to break down. Okay, so this is called expansion for obvious reasons because debt of G is like a volume element around, uh, in fact, uh, V precisely is the volume element. That's also why it's called V around uh, any point. And uh, the time variation of V tells me whether the volume is shrinking or expanding. And that's why it's logical to call it the expansion. Okay, of course, it could be a negative expansion, which means it's shrinking. Okay. So that's theta. What is shear? Shear is actually a tensor. So we write it as sigma upper i lower j of x and t. And it's defined as follows. 
you take g i k g dot j k i and j being distinct okay but you subtract its trace part so minus 1 over d minus 1 delta i j g i k well this is bad notation let's do it a little better g k l g dot k l okay and trace sigma is equal to zero uh the sigma which is the same as sigma i i it's uh, it since it has one index up and one index down you can just equate and sum you don't need to introduce any metric for this trace and this uh, trace is zero uh, by this definition and it's guaranteed by the choice of the second term which basically subtracts the trace part so it's traceless okay so this quantity sigma is traceless now so apart from the traceless part which are the trace part which we subtracted it's basically g upper i k g lower j k dot okay it's clear that we want to define something like this because remember the einstein equation it had precisely that quantity g i k g dot j k and twice okay so there's going to be a sigma squared term in the einstein equation okay meanwhile the first term um in the einstein equation this one is going to give me v dot but there's a trace part over here which is going to contribute and it's actually going to give me v squared or theta squared actually so let me uh, go through the rest of the calculation so this is the definition of sigma why is it called the shear okay so let's notice that if this is a special case g j k is equal to some constant sorry g dot j k is equal to some constant times g j k so this is isotropy if the metric has a certain shape then as time evolves it retains the same shape okay so at any time the time evolution of gjk is proportional to the value of gjk itself so it always remains proportional to the value it had in terms of directions okay now if i take this special case isotropy and plug it in here i get that sigma ij is zero it's an easy exercise and you should do it basically what happens is that the two terms uh, in this thing cancel each other okay so because of that uh, this implies that uh, sigma ij is a measure of anisotropy okay good so we've defined so this is a lot of definitions and the purpose of the definitions is going to be to simplify this equation actually very honestly Raichaudhuri's equation is just this equation okay uh, plugged into this formula which is Einstein's equation. Witten even calls it einstein raichaudhuri equation which doesn't make sense to me. Einstein equation is the general uh, name is the name for the general equation Raichaudhuri's equation is the one where we take einstein's equation go into these geodesic coordinates define these quantities v and theta uh, as well as the shear sigma and rewrite it in terms of v theta and sigma okay so now for that we just need one little formula which again i've derived in the appendix of my notes if i take this sigma and square it and then take the trace so sigma is traceless but its square is not traceless and i find a very nice identity by taking the trace of the square uh, all these calculations are actually in raichaudhuri's paper in slightly different notation then you get g i k g dot j k g j l g i l dot which is very nice but there's an extra term minus one over d minus one theta squared theta was v dot upon v here 
So you get this extra term. Okay. But this is very nice that we got this because this was in R00. It was here. So now we can rewrite R00 and finally equate it to the stress tensor. So we eventually get that R00 in terms of these variables has one term minus theta dot. That's this term. That's just this term directly. Hmm? This term is minus theta dot uh, from this equation. And then it has this term, which has a trace of sigma squared and a theta squared. And that is minus one by d minus one theta squared minus trace sigma squared. So that's just clever rewriting of R in terms of the metric, but entirely in terms of uh, two quantities, theta and sigma, which are made up by contracting the three-dimensional metric in various ways. Three-dimensional metric is all there is in this problem. It's a function though of x and t, and this only uh, depends on uh, t derivatives. In fact, the only t derivative, well, inside theta and sigma, there are time derivatives, and then theta is further differentiated. Okay, now we finally substitute this in Einstein's equation. So I could have actually delayed introducing that equation even till now. And we get theta dot and taking different terms to different sides, theta dot plus one over d minus one theta squared is minus trace of sigma squared minus 8 pi g t hat 0, 0. Okay. And this is right Chaudhary's equation. Let's put a box around it and let's pause for questions. Okay. Yeah, questions? You should think of it as an equation telling me the time evolution of theta, which in turn is the is uh, v dot upon v, where v is dead to the half of the metric, three metric. And there is the term sigma on the right, which means that it's very going to be very hard to integrate this equation. And we are not going to integrate the equation. We are instead going to use it to find some bounds. This trace of sigma squared term specifies the anisotropy. Yes, in the sense that it is the anisotropy contribution to this equation. Okay, if there's no anisotropy, that means sigma is zero, then of course trace sigma squared will also be zero and there won't be that contribution. Now, uh, one comment is that if you look at Rai Chaudhary or Wald's uh, book, uh, you'll find that uh, both of them have this extra twist term on the right-hand side of this equation, uh, which comes from not having the geodesics intersecting the Cauchy surface orthogonally. And uh, Rai Chaudhary actually does something with that, but he never quite sets it to zero. While Wald eventually says, well, look, why don't we just take the geodesics intersecting orthogonally and then it's zero. Now, our goal in getting to this equation is to treat it as a bound. And it will be a bound if I can argue that both terms on the right-hand side are negative. They look negative, but that doesn't mean they are negative. Okay. So, let's comment on that. There are no questions so far. Uh, trace sigma squared is greater than or equal to zero. It's just the trace of the square of a d minus one cross d minus one matrix, three cross three matrix with all real entries. If I take any uh, thing and square it and take the trace, any matrix with real entries, I'll always get something that's greater than or equal to zero. And in particular, uh, it'll be equal to zero only if sigma itself is zero. Uh, uh, hi, Samir, could I ask the question? Yeah, please. Uh, so we're uh, just trying to interpret this equation. So uh, theta we have defined as an expansion parameter because, as you said, it's it's uh, it's related to some v and it's just v dot by v. So yeah. it tells you how things expand in in yeah. this time that we have defined. That's uh, right. This geodesic time. So so then you're basically saying that Rajchandri 
the Rayshaw's equation is something that tells you how, like, uh, can can I interpret it as a clump of particles? How it will, how they will diverge from each other or converge to each other? Is is that the intuition? Well, so far, of uh, course, eventually that is the intuition. Yes, but uh, so far we have tried not to introduce any particles. But of course, free particles follow world lines which are geodesics. But you know, all particles are not free in general. Right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I I was thinking of free particles. Yes. Yeah. So, so for free so particles, then, you can think of it. Yes. And obviously, that's an intuition at the back of this. Correct. So then, uh, uh, do you do you also do you also have some way of thinking about this uh, RHS then? Uh, in this way of thinking about it, uh, not the T zero zero part, but the sigma squared part. Yeah, so that's uh, that's you know this is really an equation for how you see Einstein equations are equations for how space time responds uh, to um, a stress tensor, basically, right, to the presence of matter. So uh, the best way to think of this is, so one way to think of this is take trace sigma squared to the left side where it actually started life because the then the whole left side is the is entirely dependent only on space time. Hmm? Theta depends only on gij and its derivatives. Theta squared also depends on gij and its derivatives. Uh, sigma square, sigma also depends on gij and its derivatives. While t hat depends on what matter you have, uh, and also depends on the cosmological constant. Neither, both of which you have to decide before you do anything. Okay, so really speaking, if you want to think of this as Einstein's equation, then trace sigma squared belongs on the term belongs on the left. But it's also a very annoying term because it doesn't depend on dead G. It depends on components of G. Okay. While theta depends only on dead G. And if we are focusing on the behavior, that pun was not intended. If we want to study the behavior of dead G, then we'll take trace sigma squared on the right and we'll only use its positivity to get rid of it and make a bound. Okay, if both terms, so let me say that now, and this point will become clearer. And uh, Shikhar, I'll come back to your question in a minute. So this is positive. Now two, T hat zero zero gets positive contribution from ordinary matter. In fact, Rai Chaudhary doesn't write it as T zero zero. He writes it as some particular matter density, which is how people usually think of it. So for him, uh, it's basically t um, t upper zero, lower zero is some fixed row. Okay, so it's a contribution from ordinary matter, uh, and then it's positive. Uh, it's positive if it's a contribution from ordinary matter. Okay. But T hat zero zero has, okay, now let's look back at the definition of this T hat. It has all these, both these terms, but the whole thing together, when I put mu nu equals zero zero, turns out to be positive for ordinary matter. Okay, that's something I'm not going to verify, but you can verify. The problem is this term. Now, if I put T zero zero, you see that I get G zero zero here, that's minus one. So T hat zero zero contains minus lambda. Okay. And because of that, it is positive if lambda is negative and it's negative if lambda is positive. Okay. Now, Unfortunately, as far as we know, lambda is positive in the real world. And therefore, we T hat has a negative contribution. Okay, these are these are contributions. Hmm? So these three arrows, uh, well, the first arrow is the contribution of matter, and the second two are exclusive. Uh, you can either have lambda less than zero or greater than zero, or of course, you can have it equal to zero. And um, I emphasize that, uh, so just a couple of days ago here in CERN, I attended a lecture on experimental tests of general relativity. And um, well, there are still possibilities that the way we think about 
things is wrong and maybe lambda isn't what, what we think it is. But uh, the consensus as of today is that lambda is positive. Nevertheless, what we are going to do is assume that t hat 0, 0 is greater than 0. And we're not going to assume it in the sense that we assume it and then we believe it forever as an item of faith. Okay. By the way, I want to emphasize that even if lambda, even though lambda is positive, it's the total uh, value of t hat that we care about, okay, which is matter uh, plus cosmological constant. So it will certainly be positive if I have enough conventional matter, but it will be if lambda is positive, then t hat will be negative in the vacuum, and that won't be very nice. But I'm going to assume t hat 0, 0 is positive, and the consequences that we find, therefore, will be only true if this assumption is true. Okay, I'm emphasizing this for students because often students jump to the wrong conclusion that when I assume something, now I'm stuck with it, now I've invested my belief system in it, and now I'm having faith in it. That's not so. I'm assuming this and showing you what consequences arise, and then we can reflect on whether there are situations where the assumption was true, then the conclusions will also be true. Okay, so let's assume this, and then we have a bound. If we assume, uh, so from this fact, which is definitely true, and this fact, which is an assumption, we realize that the entire right-hand side of these equations is less than zero. And therefore, we get a bound that this combination of theta and theta dot is negative for all time. So let me write that plus one by d minus one theta squared is less than zero for all t. I do want to emphasize that this is true for all t. It's not true for any particular time. All t as long as the coordinate system is valid. Yeah. Now let me pause for these two questions. Is considering time-like curves intersecting sigma orthogonally in essence just as general as them intersecting at any angle? That's a very good question and I puzzled over it uh, for quite some time. And I believe it is. I believe it boils down to a choice of coordinate system. And here, uh, what matters is your perspective. If you want to study the behavior of a geodesic congruence, then of course, uh, the congruence which doesn't intersect orthogonally uh, is a geodesic congruence. And then you need to study that and that will have that term. But if you want to think of this as study of a space-time in a convenient coordinate system, then the geodesic congruence that you like is the one which is orthogonal, hypersurface orthogonal as it's called. So you might as well restrict to that. So Witten, I think, wisely just restricts to that case. Wald allows this uh, twist term for quite some time. So it's one more term besides theta and sigma. And it contributes something on the wrong side, and that our, uh, contribution is positive. So it spoils our bound in any case. So right from the outset, uh, uh, from the perspective of choosing a coordinate system, yes, we are entitled to take it to be uh, uh, such that the geodesics are orthogonal. Can space-time possess geodesics to be diverging rather than converging? Yes, it can. Uh, yes, it can. And in fact, this is a kind of problem that Witten imagines that if uh, we are trying to look for focusing and if G33 goes to zero so that we have uh, focusing in this direction uh, of certain geodesics, uh, we'll still call it focusing. But if geodesics which had different separation were instead diverging at the same time, then it could be that the determinant would not be zero that this would not be equivalent to this being zero. Okay, so that can happen. Yeah, does the twist term then later dissolve? Yeah, in Wald's tree, so in, in, in Raichaudhuri's treatment, it never dissolves. It's always there till the very end. Um, and he talks about, see, Raichaudhuri is not literally only trying to use his equation as a bound and um, try to deduce focal points. That is part of it, but he's trying to generally compare what his equation tells us for different types of cosmologies and compare it with, you know, compare isotropic and non-isotropic models. We are here not looking at models, but actually trying to make a theory of when the coordinate system breaks down so that we can discuss Hawking's uh, 
singularity theorem in a following lecture. Uh, as for Wald, yes, for Wald, it does dissolve. At some point, he says, well, let us take our geodesic congruence to be hypersurface orthogonal, and then that term goes away. Okay, And I emphasize that if we don't do that, we don't get this bound, and we don't know what to do next. We still have Raichaudhuri's equation. See, the equation is worth much more than what I'm going to do with it. Actually, in five minutes, you'll be a little shocked that the conclusions we draw from this um, aren't as may not appear as meaningful as you might have hoped. Okay, so let's quickly finish this calculation because we are running out of time. Now, here is where Raichaudhuri's choice of um, the G function uh, comes in very handy, and I'm going to continue in terms of that. G equals v to the 1 by d minus 1, uh, and that's equal to det to the 1 over 2 d minus 1 gij. Okay. Now, theta is defined in terms of v. Theta is v dot over v. And uh, it's also g dot over g with a different coefficient because, um, because g and v are related by a power. So, log g and log v are related by a constant. But the nice thing is that if I use that, and I, this is obviously why Raichaudhuri used it, you simply get g double dot less than zero for all t. Much simpler equation. If you use the uh, upper form, this form, you have to do a few gym gymnastics to extract some physics from it. If you use this form, the gymnastics are considerably reduced. Okay, so good. Now, from this, we can deduce the following. Let's take d by dt of g upon g dot. Okay, so what is it by chain rule? It's one because I start by differentiating g upstairs. And then the next term is minus g, g double dot over g dot square. Okay. Now, you see that g itself is positive, is positive because we are starting the time evolution near the Cauchy surface and where nothing has broken down. And g is a determinant. It's root of a determinant of a metric. So it's positive. So this term is positive. Oops. I did something bad here. So this term is positive. This denominator is g dot squared. We don't need to know the sign of g dot, but its square being the square of a real quantity is also positive. And finally, this quantity here is negative from this equation, from Raichaudhuri equation. So we have actually boiled Raichaudhuri's equation off completely until it became just this much. About just this bound. And so we find that this is greater than 1. If you want, you can keep it as greater than or equal to 1 for all t. And it's true for all t. Okay. Don't ever forget what g is. Huh? Otherwise, you'll miss the significance. g is just a proxy for debt of the metric, but happens to be raised to some fractional power. Okay. So now if we, if this is true, then it means that g upon g dot as a function of time is g upon g dot initial plus is greater than or equal to g upon g dot initial plus t. Okay, why is that? Well, I have a function g over g dot whose slope is always greater than one. So look at the linear function, this is the linear function. And here I have a function whose slope is always greater than one. So it's always greater than the linear function. That's all I'm saying. Hmm? So uh, that's just a trivial statement. So that's how I got this bound. Excuse me. Now suppose at the initial time, g over g dot was negative at t equals 0, g over g dot was some number, uh, let's call it minus alpha. Hmm? So negative number, alpha is a positive number. Then this implies that g over g dot as a function of t is greater than or equal to t minus alpha. And now we can integrate this to find that g of t is bounded above by g of 0 
1 minus t by alpha. And we see that g of t actually goes to 0 as t tends to alpha. So we've actually proven that under conditions where the see the initial conditions on the Cauchy surface should involve the metric small g and its first derivative, right? And Einstein equations are second derivative equations which evolve it. So for a suitable choice of initial conditions, namely g over g dot is negative, okay, which actually means g dot is negative. So you can rewrite this as g dot is proportional to g with a coefficient minus one by alpha. Uh, then for that choice, g is going to go to zero and therefore debt of g i j goes to zero. Therefore, we have a focal point. And therefore, the coordinates break down. And this is exactly what we were trying to check. Uh, we were trying to see when it happens. Uh, so we see that coordinates are chosen in this way following Rai Chaudhary uh, will indeed break down if T is the uh, stress tensor is positive and the initial conditions uh, are suitable. Okay, what is suitable actually is that the first derivative of the metric is negative. Uh, and that means actually that the things are contracting from the uh, initial value. And Einstein equation says if they are contracting, they will keep contracting until uh, debt of G actually, debt of the metric actually goes to zero. So that's basically what I want to tell you today. But uh, in the remaining three minutes, uh, let me give you a little disappointing conclusion. Uh, I call it disappointing example because it will make you wonder if all this was worth it. By the way, please don't wonder whether Rai Chaudhary's equation was worth it. It had many other applications and the application we are going to use it for is Hawking singularity theorem, which still has a value. But the disappointing example is take M equals Minkowski. You could have thought about this long ago and asked. Uh, and let's take sigma to be literally this surface. Okay, where this is x and that is t. This is x, y, z and that is t. A wiggly surface like this. Okay. Now everything is clear in Minkowski. This is literally the space-time exactly looks like this. It's flat and the metric is just Minkowski metric. And now if I draw a geodesic normally intersecting here and normally intersecting here, then bang, they're going to meet each other and you have your focal point there. On the other hand, if I draw a past directed geodesic from here and another one from here, you're going to have a focal point there. So with this choice of Cauchy surface, you have an absolute party of lots of focal points everywhere in the future and past. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with Minkowski space-time. So this shows uh, that coordinate system breakdown could be, can be unrelated to any uh, geometrical property. So there it is. Any questions? Can be, but it was, it's not always really, uh, unrelated. Yeah. Any questions? Had you chosen uh, a geodesics that needn't have uh, hypersurface orthogonally intersected the sigma then? Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. There are geodesic congruences which don't break down. Okay. But those aren't the ones from which I get the Rai Chaudhary bound. This bound. And I'm trying to derive some, I, I, not trying, I succeeded in deriving some meaningful conclusion from this, that if this is true, which is the same as this being true, then it follows that this is true and therefore the metric goes to zero. 
If you had a non-hypersurface orthogonal family of geodesics, you would have a twist term in the right Chaudhary equation, which would be positive, unfortunately. Uh, and it's there in both Rai Chaudhary's paper and in Wald's uh, book. And so there's no bound. Once you have a positive term on the right side of the equation, there's no, there's no less than zero bound like this one. So two different things can spoil this bound. One is taking the non-orthogonal geodesics and the other is taking a positive cosmological constant. Both of them can spoil this bound. And in that case, the final conclusions don't hold. And I want to emphasize this is a very live subject of research. So, you know, what you should do uh, and how we understand GR today, uh, which also involves extra uh, effects of quantum gravity and so on, that's not, none of that is included. This is really a historic, history based lecture. In Hawking's time, if I uh, am not mistaken, we simply assumed that lambda is zero and proceeded from there. Yeah. In non-hyperbolic -hyper space-time, which have no Cauchy surface, uh, we, uh, yeah, so, okay, uh, it's a good question, Sanket. So, if something is not a Cauchy surface, as you know, it still has a domain of dependence. If it is a Cauchy surface, then its domain of dependence is my full manifold. If it's not a Cauchy surface, it has its own domain of dependence, which may not be my full manifold. But if I stay within that domain of dependence, then uh, the same thing, uh, everything I've done today holds. Okay, But holds strictly only within the domain of dependence. In a sense, you can make any acronal surface be a Cauchy hypersurface by choosing your manifold to be the domain of dependence of that surface. Okay, let's stop here. So I'll see you all on Monday. So, uh, yeah, could you go please. over this one uh, bit after g, g by g dot is greater than or equal to t minus oh. r? Okay. Okay, so this one. How did you get okay. the next one? Next, just step. integrate. Okay, okay. Cool. So uh, I'll uh, I can sketch it for you. Take this or uh, uh, this equation. Just take one over the equation. So g dot over g is less than one over t minus alpha. Yeah. Left side is d by dt of log g. If I integrate the right side dt over t minus alpha, I get log t minus alpha. And then, um, yeah, uh, yeah, then I just choose G0 at T equals zero. And I rewrite uh, till I get this form. So it's just the integral of the previous line. Hmm? Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, you can see how it's done in Witten's notes. It's quite a bit more tedious, but it's exactly the same conclusion. It's the same formula, actually. It's just that uh, with G, it's so much simpler. Uh, I just it just felt nice somehow that Rai Chaudhary got this idea right to use uh, capital G instead of V. It may not be of most general use, but for integrating this bound, it's absolutely the simplest way. Okay, thank you. Uh, could I ask question of this time? Please, please. Uh, so uh, it's a question about this interpretation that we discussed a few minutes ago. So um, I. So I, I I had this intuition of the right other equation as uh, as I said of these particles of this clump of particles either diverging or converging. But when mm. I think of that, I think of that in a given space time. I'm not doing dynamical GR, but uh, it seems to me that the way we've derived it today, uh, we've used the Einstein equations. We've, we have, oh, we have another interpretation of it where where you're thinking of the volume element changing in a dynamical space time. So how do I reconcile these two? I don't know. Uh, is there a way of thinking of Rai Chaudhary equations in a fixed space time? Because both Rai, Rai Chaudhary's paper itself is called relativistic cosmology. And cosmology, by definition, is the evolution of space time with time. I see. Okay. Maybe I was mistaken. Okay. So Thank you. I think that, yeah, I don't know. There may be some context which I don't know, but I'm not aware of because I, uh, I only understand it in this way that it's, but you say you nailed it. What you said just now is true. It's really telling me how space time evolves by Einstein equations. Uh, last thing, uh, we are a bit over time, but some bit, if G over G dot was positive, good point. Uh, that simply would change the sign of alpha over here and we would get one plus T over alpha. 
And what you see now is that indeed uh, g of t would not go to zero in the future, but it would go to zero in the past at t equals minus alpha, minus mod of that alpha. Hmm? And so there would be a focal point in the past. So uh, whichever sign you pick for g over g dot, it only changes whether the focal point is in the past or the future. And uh, now, of course, you, there are different physical questions. You know, one is whether you know our coordinate system will break down in the future, so we can't predict things. The other is whether it had broken down in the past, so we can't be sure what things we are using to predict our world. And the, it's the latter which really Rai Chaudhary had in mind because he explicitly talks about um, models which start cosmological models which start from what he calls the singular state capital G equals zero. And that's exactly the uh, state uh, of the universe when uh, the sign is opposite and the focal point is in the past. Okay. Till Monday then. And so on uh, next Friday, there will not be a class that is on 14th. But I request somebody from ICTS, I don't know if it's Omkar or who else, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thing, to email uh, me, email me and let's fix up a little chat on the phone or something on WhatsApp to uh, not, not now, but on Monday uh, to fix when we have the substitute lecture, because I actually have a hard deadline to finish before the end of April, and that is 28th of April, I think. Uh, 